Hello everyone, this is David the Real Med White. Welcome to the first official video of our Refutation of Oriental Hate Orthodoxy video series. If you haven't seen it, I would recommend you check out part zero that I uploaded yesterday. Uh, it's kind of an announcement video about this series. And this video is going to be less about apologetics and more about just giving you a context of, of the whole issue and of the whole debate. So for this video, we're going to be talking about the terminology, right? There's, because terminologically speaking, there's a lot of issues. I would recommend you check this video out if you if you know about the terminology, if you're aware of the history and all of that stuff. You don't really need to watch this video, but if you need to learn, this is the video for you that you consider as a tutorial in, in the disputations that occur between the Orthodox and the Oriental Orthodox, which I will be referring to as anti-Chalcedonian um, throughout the video series consistently. So we are going to be looking at terminology, terminological difficulties, what what nature means in both sides, what certain terms mean in both sides. We will look at the common misconceptions that from both sides. So basically meme apologetics that both sides use against each other. Uh, we will look at the basic contrast between the preferred formulas in two natures and out of two natures versus just out of two natures. So this could also be, this is more widely known as diophysis and miaphysis, right? We're going to be looking into these. And I already have a video on this. You can check that out, explaining miaphysis and diophysis, it's like 20 minutes. Then we're going to be looking at the timeline of the events, timeline from 428 to 451 from the election of Nestorius as a Constantinopolitan Patriarch to the Council of Chalcedon, which will give us context, helping us understand, you know, how did it come to this, uh, how, how, how the events surrounding Chalcedon came to be. We will look at the basic Christology of St. Kirill of Alexandria, and then we will compare Eastern Orthodox Christology with Oriental Christology. The anti calculating Christology. So let's start with terminological difficulties that both sides have with each other. Um, the key is really what the word nature means. Both sides have a different understanding of what nature means, and this actually does cause a lot of confusion. And for the purpose of this video, not only this video, but also throughout the entire video series, I will refrain from using the word nature unless I really have to. But from our perspective, nature is essence. It means essence, it means usia, it means substance. For the anti calcedonians uh, essence means hypostasis, uh, sorry, nature means hypostasis. And so this already is a very crucial difference that allows us to understand what both sides are trying to say. So there are common misconceptions from, the, from our side. Um, a lot of the misconception comes from that the anti calcedonians are all Eutychians. Well, that's not really true. Officially speaking, if we are to steal man their position, instead of trying to straw man their position, but if you want to steal man their position, at the very least, on a surface level, Severus and, and, and the beliefs of the mainstream Oriental theologians is that they're completely against Eutychian. So Eutychianism is actually considered as a heresy in the anti calcedonian churches, whether you're, the, you're in the Coptic church, whether you're in the Armenian church, that all, whether you're in the um, Ethiopian church, right? These are all in communion with each other. They all consider Eutychianism as heretical. Um, anti calcedonians believe that nature is synonymous with essence is what we just covered. They have a different understanding with what nature means. For them, physis, nature means hypostasis. And a lot of people make this mistake that anti calcedonians are completely against St. Kirill. We're going to be going to this more in detail in the later video series. But I will say, on a basic level, that's wrong. Um, they, are, they at least try to be very faithful to St. Kirill. And even uh, many theologians do state that even Dioscurus, right, one of the, one of the Kirillian successors, you could say, is actually consistent with St. Kirill's theology, where they differ, where we differ, is that both of us are pretty consistent on a basic level. Where we end up differing is that the Orientals don't really accept the concessions that St. Kirill gave to what will later become Chalcedonian th uh, theology. 
and they argue that it's 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 not the mainstream Kirillian taught, and therefore we're moving away from Saint Kirill, right? So this is where the differences started rising, and you will over time understand as this video series goes, you will start to understand what we're exactly talking about. So what misconceptions do all anti calcadonians have against us? Well, a lot of their saints, when we say into natures that Christ is into natures, uh, they think the natures here is hypostasis so it's kind of like the misconceptions that we do but in reverse <laughs> so they think we're saying into hypostases which we don't say that we, we don't we don't say that for us nature means essence and they say that we reject saint kill's doctrines because we refuse to see out of two natures now in in the council of Chalcedon, now they will say for example the fifth council Constantinople to corrected Chalcedon, but for them it doesn't really uh, it doesn't really prove that Chalcedon is still a good council, which again is, is an argument we will tackle in a future video that will be uploaded tomorrow. Again, uh, the re reason why though in Chalcedon we were dealing with a specific heresy, which was Eutychianism, which was enabled by the Second Council of Ephesus, which the Oriental Church accepts as ecumenical. Um, this is why Intonatius was preferred. It is to combat the heresy of Eutychianism, right? So, for example, if someone has the sickness of denying Christ's divinity, um, like the Gnostics and, and Arians, then the medicine that you will apply is to prove Christ's divinity. And, for, and if someone is denying his humanity, well, the medicine you will apply is to show that he is a human, right? And so that, that perspective is very important. We can't really look at councils in a vacuum. We can't really look at them individually. Ultimately, they are connected with all of the councils that they're a part of. Trying to look at councils in a vacuum is really not going to help us understand what's going on. So the context is very important here. This is a very key misconception that a lot of Oriental apologists miss. So what is the difference between these two formulas, right? So into natures, which is the Diophysis formula, is emphasizing on the duality, right? The duality of properties, the duality of essences in Christ after the union. So Christ has two energies. Christ has two wills, right? He has a human will and human energy, and he has a human, a divine will and divine energy. And these properties endure uh, in a distinct manner after the union. And Christ naturally has two essences. Whereas for Mia, Mia Physite, uh, Christ is a, well, for, sorry, for Mia Physis, right, out of two natures, which is Mia Physis, it signifies a single hypostasis that is composed out of two natures. Uh, you can consider them as essences, you can consider them as hypostasis. There are fathers that use, that use nature in both senses. Uh, so these are what those formulas, generally speaking, signify. Of course, we can't really end up being, um, how should I say this, Talmudic about these formulas, right? We can't really consider them as, oh, you know, you need to say the magic words, otherwise you're not really saying the formulas. We don't, we don't really have that view. We shouldn't really have that view. So what happened in the timeline, right? What happened from uh, the election of Nestorius, right? Nestorius in 428 becomes Patriarch of Constantinople. He denies that that, uh, that, the, that Mary is Theotokos, which the St. Kirill hearing this, considered this as a very important thing to deal with and starts to compose writings and also starts to study the fathers to refute Nestorius' heresies. And from that time on until the Council of Ephesus, uh, one interesting thing that happens while St. Kirill is, you know, um, dealing with Nestorius, is writing letters, and Nestorius is write, writing letters back to him, and St. Kirill is dealing with other people about this issue. What's really interesting that I have to note is that St. Leo, who at the time was an arch, archdeacon, uh, with the assistance of him, Nestorius ends up being condemned by the West in 430. So t two things really important happens here. St. Leo hears what's going on with Nestorius, and he tries to tell uh, Pope St. Celestine about it. He says, oh, you know, there's this Nestorius guy. He's saying he's denying Theotokos. He's doing these things, right? So this makes St. John Cassian write a Christological treatise against Nestorianism. And this causes Pope St. Celestine 
to not only give St. Kirill the go to condemn Nestorius, but also for him to even anatomatize Nestorius before the council. Which, by the way, this, uh, this causes a very interesting question for the Roman Catholics. Why didn't he just anatomatize? Why didn't he, he use his Vatican I magic powers and anatomatize Nestorius? Why did we need the Council of Ephesus for this? Right, could the Pope just anatomatize Nestorius and use his extraordinary magisterial power? Of course not. Uh, or ordinary, extraordinary, whatever you want to say. It. No. Neither was used because neither didn't exist back then. So in 431, Council of Ephesus happens. Uh, John of Antioch, the Patriarch of Antioch, arrives late to the council. And after the council is done, he's very unhappy with what happened. And he starts an historian council and then anatomatizes St. Kirill. So now we have two uh, councils here. We have the Ephesian council, accepted by the Pope. And we have the Nestorian council, ex uh, accepted by the Emperor. And eventually what makes Ephesus an ecumenical uh, council is not really that it was accepted by the Pope. Actually, it was accepted by the emperor, and that's why it ended up being ecumenical. So, <laughs> that's also another funny tidbit that I have to add. That's very important to note. This doesn't mean case you're a papism. This doesn't really imply that, but it implies certain things about Orthodox epistemology. For example, that reception, right? The the In that specific instance, the emperor receiving that council, with the whole empire also receiving that council, made that council ecumenical doesn't mean that its truth value changed rather it's made it became clear to us that it's a true council and that we re that the church received it so for two years however uh there was there was a schism between antioch and alexandria because of this and therefore the formal of reunion happened saint kirill and john of antioch get together and they compose letters and they compose writings and they accept each other and they re-establish communion. Now, there are some very important things to consider here. First of all, the Antiochian Christology was believed into nature's formula. Again, we will go into detail about this more. But it's very important to consider. There's a In the formula for union, both sides kind of get out of uh, formulas. And they just say, well, we both believe there's a union of two natures. One interesting thing that happened is that Saint Kirill also says that certain uh, actions of actions of the divine nature are proper to the divine, and the actions of the human nature are proper to the humanity. Uh, human uh, act to the humanity. Sorry. And so this is very important. So these formulations have happened, and what what also happens is that for Antiochians they understand mia physis as mia hypostasis. And so this also gives us an idea that suddenly people are starting to realize that, okay, what he's saying is that Christ, by saying that Christ is one nature, he's actually signifying that he is one hypostasis. And both sides kind of end up understanding. We see that in both sides, Antiochians and St. Kirill, starts defending each other's doctrines. And afterwards, uh, while St. Kirill does defend the doctrines of the Antiochians, he actually goes on offense and starts attacking the teachings of Theodore of Tarsus and Theodore of Mopsuestia. This is very important because these two are the originators of Nestorianism, and Theodore of Mopsuestia, as a matter of fact, is condemned as a heretic in the Fifth Council of Constantinople. He writes that Christ is one, uh, also known as the, On the Unity of Christ, that you can buy on Amazon, you can, you can read that document right now. Uh, where he affirms Mia Physis, so he's still not straying away from his mainline, mainstream Christological formulations. That is very important to note, because a lot of Orientals try to emphasize that, but we accept that, we understand that. And we understand that because Mia Physis in that sense is signifying one hypostasis, it's not signifying one essence of Christ, right? This is very important to understand. If you want to move on, what happens is St. Proclus becomes a character in the scene and starts to spread St. Kirill's theology to Byzantine Constantinople, Byzantine Anatolia, and his Christology starts to become more and more mainstream. St. Kirill dies in 4 444. Theodore of Cyrus composes Arianistus. Now, this is very important because what we will see in the book of Arianistus is he actually deviates from his Nestorian tradition and starts defending Kirillian concepts. 
in a future video, in, a in the video where we defend the Council of Chalcedon, we are going to go into this in a lot more detail. But this is a very interesting work because the Christology in the Book of Ernestus is pretty orthodox. I don't think anti chalcedonists have really read that book. Um, they cite that book, but I don't think they have really read that book. Uh, but to give more context and more understanding, it is correct indeed that Theodoret was an historian and did and still considered Theodoret and Theodore as his teachers because he's part of that tradition. But the Christ what I'm saying is that in 447, by the time he composes Arianistus, his Christology changes to a more Kyrillian direction. Eutychus is condemned as a heretic in 448 by Saint Flavian. Eutychus was a very confused old man who didn't really know what he was talking about. And this, this actually caused a lot of problems and might even be the foundation of a huge schism. Because in the Robert Council of Ephesus 449, uh, the Oscurus of Antioch, uh, the Oscurus of Alexandria, sorry, who succeeds St. Kirill, reinstates Eutychius, deposes Theodoret of Cyrus and Ibas, and they're not even able to defend themselves. So St. Flavian, uh, Theodoret, Ibas, they were deposed without being able to defend themselves. And this is one of the many questionable events. Uh, why are you deposing, why are you getting rid of these people without even letting them defend themselves if you're calling them to the council, right? This is one very problematic thing that occurred in the council. Uh, Saint Flavian was beaten up. There are some disputations whether Saint Flavian died because of being beaten up instantly or whether he died months later. But the argument, I believe, still stands that Saint Flavian was indeed beaten up. And if, he, and if he died like a couple months later, that doesn't really change the cause of death. You can still die months later, but the reason of death can still be because of you being beaten up, right? And it still doesn't avoid the skullduggery that happened in the Robert Council of Ephesus. And one interesting thing is that St. Kill's family were hunted according to his family members. Now, anti is considered this as a Chalcedonian propaganda, but... St. Kill's own family says this in the Council of Chalcedon, it's in the Minutes of Cal Chalcedonian Council. So the implication is, there's two implications. Either Dioscurus is a very violent person uh, that for some reason is trying to get rid of St. Kill's legacy, or St. Kill's family is a family of liars. And I think both implications are kind of problematic uh, for the Oriental side. And finally, the Council of Chalcedon happens, and this is where stuff starts to get real, right? Things start to get really real. So let's talk about St. Kirill's Christology a little, little bit. Um, St. Kirill's central point is that Christ is united and that he's a single hypostasis. Contrasted that with Nestorius' beliefs, which a lot of people don't really know, but Nestorius believed in a union of prosopa, and he believed that there's two persons in Christ united in a single person. And this unity is based on power, will, and prosopic manifestation rather than an essential unity. Uh, this this line is from Father John McGuckin's book, St. Kill of Alexander and the Christological Controversy. So this, as St. Kill notes, will be a union akin to God's union with his saints. Right? It will kind of be akin to that. So it's still ends up being a theology of two sons, even if Nestorius didn't really believe it. Uh, contrasted with St. Kirill's Christology, there's a strong emphasis on the singular hypostasis of Christ. Christ is composed out of two natures. So he remains consubstantial with us in humanity and consubstantial with God in his divinity. This is a point that um, I believe both Amphichalcedonians and Chalcedonians will share on the surface level. Uh, Christ has two wills. He has a real human will and a real divine will. And his human will is limited, but it's not absolutely limited. So it's a, it's a non-absolute limitation. And again, if you look at Father McGuckin's book, St. Kirill of Alexandria, The Christological Controversy, particularly the pages 1 to 3 and 1 to 4, you can see how St. Kirill is using two wills in Christ to prove uh, that he's a single person, which is very interesting to note. And... One, one thing to also make clear here is that St. Kirill is dealing with Nestorianism, right? So, of course, naturally, he's emphasizing the single, uh, the unity of Christ. 
uh, and this emphasis shouldn't be thought of as something as uh, as him anatomizing all forms of supposed dualism. All actions of Christ are attributed to his hypostasis ultimately, so there is a communication of properties uh, between the humanity and the divinity. So this is how we can say that God suffered and died on the cross. Suffering and dying is something attributed to the humanity, to the human essence. However, because Christ was united hypostatically to humanity, he appropriated the suffering to himself. So we can say God walked, we can say God uh, ate, God was hungry, God was tired. We can say all of these things because there's an exchange of properties between the divinity and humanity. And ultimately, all of these are attributed to the single divine hypostasis of Christ. And this is also a very important point in St. Kirill's Christology uh, that we emphasize. So let us finalize this video by comparing the two Christologies in a basic level. For us, we will say that Christ is into natures and out of two natures. So both Diophysis and Miaphysis for us are both acceptable. This will mean that Christ has two energies, he has two wills, but at the same time he is a single hypostasis composed out of two essences, two natures. For the Anticalcadonic position, Miaphysis is the main line Christology, but they refuse the Ephysitism. And so what this ends up being is that because Christ is one nature out of two natures, and nature is understood as hypostasis, he has one energy and one will because they are properties of hypostasis in their view. So Christ is divine by nature and hypostatic united to human nature. Um, in another way, we can say that Christ is divine by hypostasis and he's hypostatically united to a human impersonal hypostasis. And this is kind of like the difference that we have. And of course, these are surface differences. And for some of you, this might seem like, oh, this is kind of just nothing. But this is why I will recommend you check out from three days uh, that I'm going to be uploading this. We are going to be doing a stream with Jay Dyer focused specifically on the Christology of Severus of Antioch, on the, on the Oriental Christology and the Christology of many other characters that are very important, Philoxenus of Mabok, for example. And we're going to be comparing it with our Christology and see where the problems lie. And so on a surface level, it looks very similar, but once someone goes in depth and once someone analyzes the differences, the differences are huge, the differences are major. And so um, I would like to conclude the video here. Next video, part two, is going to be on the Council of Chalcedon. We're going to be defending the Council of Chalcedon and argue that the Chalcedonian Council is orthodox. And we're going to be arguing against the anatomas of Dioscorus, the six anatomas of Dioscorus against Chalcedon. And we will respond to all of them. We will respond to all of them sufficiently. So I'll see you guys in the next video. I'll see you guys tomorrow. Um, check out part two and check out part zero. The announcement video if you haven't thank you all for watching this god bless you all have a great day see you tomorrow